Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Crowds on here. Um, as far as announcement goes, this week all we have is Wednesday night. We have women's Bible study. I'll be at our place seven o'clock. I don't think there's anything else. Anybody have anything? Kids church today. Okay, why don't we stand together, we'll read our song, and then we'll go into worship. Let's read. O oh, you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you chose to bring near, to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house the holiness of your temple. Father, we just thank you, God, for another opportunity to meet with you. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that's in our lives. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you only want the best for us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be satisfied uh, with your house and what your house obtains for us. We pray, God, that as we go forward, that you would be glorified in our worship. We ask in Jesus' name.
world world at the beginning One with God and love on the whole side You're hidden glory in creation Now revealing you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name My sin was great, love was great. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a Death could not hold you, but they all tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have.
minutes. We pray, God, for uh, direction for our hearts today. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would come and teach us. For we desire to hear from you. We desire to learn from your word, God. So we ask that you be with us in Jesus' name. Guys, you can go to Kids Church if you'd like. Okay, well, we have been slowly meandering our way through the book of John. We actually were moving okay, and we had needed to slow down on these portions of scriptures because I wanted to take our time and going through the process of being born again and what um, what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. <clears throat> but I want to start today with a question. The question is, when you came and met Jesus Christ, or when he came and confronted you, did anything change? Did anything happen in your life? I want you to think as we go through Scripture, as you read your Bible, you'll see that every time Jesus came in contact with people, or every time people came in contact with Him, things happened. Something happened. Something changed. Um, they didn't just come face to face with Jesus Christ and walk away the same. Very rarely did that ever happen. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. We're going to talk about this portion of Scripture that we are at. <clears throat> we've got, I know we've read John chapter 3, we've read verse 1 through 10, 1 through 15 several times. But this is how you do Bible study. You get a portion of scripture, you read it over and over, you dissect it, you pray that God would show you what he wants to accomplish in your life through his word. So the question was, did anything change when you came into contact with Jesus Christ? Did you walk away the same? Or did your life actually start to transform? We talked before about um, when we become Christians or when we come face to face with Jesus Christ, are we going through life, are we just walking through life and uh, buying a new car, I'm going to get married now, I have a wife, I'm adding her to my life, I have this, I'm adding it to my life, we're going to have some children, we're going to add them to our life. And then all of a sudden in this way we come across Jesus Christ and we say, oh yeah, he died on the cross for me, I'm going to add him to my life. And we just keep going. And we saw even in when we talked about the marriage of Cana, when he transformed water into wine, again, that he didn't add something to the, to the water. He changed it. He transformed it. And it's the same in our life. When we come into contact with Jesus Christ, uh, we don't add him to our life. He doesn't want to add stuff to our life. What he wants to do is to transform our lives, to completely change it. And that's what should happen when we come in contact with Him. We should never come in contact with Him and walk away the same. Because when He comes in contact with people, all through Scripture, think about uh, when He comes in contact with a leper, and He heals the leper, He walks away, He's a different person. When He comes in contact with a blind man, and that blind man is healed, He leaves, He's a different person. When Jesus fed the 5,000, they were hungry, when they left, they were full. Just all those different instances, when you go through Scripture, there's so many different uh, times where Christ comes in contact with people and their lives are radically changed. Sometimes it's even through, um, I know there's a couple of incidences where somebody's life has changed because somebody else came in contact with Jesus Christ. We have an incident of the, um, uh, it just escaped my mind. The centurion, he comes in contact with Jesus Christ and his servant is healed, who's miles away. 
But different aspects like that. So I guess the main point I want to make is that when you come in contact with Jesus Christ, look back in your life. When you've come in contact with Christ, are you the same? Has the, has the, the tree become a new fruit? Have you, are you producing new fruit in our life? That's the evidence of us being born again. So we want to talk about John chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 1 through 8. And then we'll go from there. John chapter 3. This is the ESV. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We'll stop there. So as we come to this portion of Scripture, we've been in chapter 3 now for, is this our third week in chapter 3, because we wanted to cover being, what it means to be born again in three points. Um, just remember that <clears throat> Being born again, the new birth, is not like, um, it's not like the makeup that a mortician puts on someone who is dead to make them look more like they're alive. That's not what the new birth is all about. It's not Jesus adding something to our life to make us seem like we're more alive. The new birth is a creation of spiritual life, not the imitation of life. In verse 6, Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we know that the flesh does have a kind of a life. Every human being is living flesh. But every human being is not a living spirit. To be a living spirit or to have spiritual life, Jesus says you must be born of the spirit. That's where spiritual life comes from. Flesh gives rise to a kind of life. And the spirit also gives rise to another kind of life. If we don't have the second kind, the scripture says that we will not see the kingdom of God. You will not even notice it. It will pass you right by. So we want to look at um, this portion of scripture where it says... Um, that you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, there's three main viewpoints, or three main schools of thought on this portion of Scripture. I'm just going to touch all three of them. And this is what they are. Three schools of thought on being born of the water and of the Spirit. Point number one is two births. One is natural, one is spiritual. The second one is one birth. Spiritual birth with water referring to baptism. Number three, it's a symbolic cleansing for spiritual renewal. So we're not going to, I'm just going to touch on all three of the points, but I don't want to get uh, too deep into all of them. That's going to have to be for another time. This will take us. You can do a whole service on each to cover each one of them. We're not going to do that today. Uh, where should we start? So the first two points that we covered about being born again 
The first one was, what happens in the new birth is not getting new religion, but getting new life. Nicodemus was perfect as far as his religion was concerned. He knew everything. He had all uh, memorized probably all the Old Testament. He knew the law of Moses. He knew the word of God at that time. But Jesus said that you need something more. The second one we covered was what happens in the new birth is not merely affirming the supernatural in Jesus, but experiencing the supernatural in ourselves. Nicodemus said that Jesus was a man from God because of the works that he did. He knew that he was from God. And Jesus said, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for you to affirm that I'm from God. But you have to experience a new birth. You have to have a supernatural take place in yourself. Okay, so this brings us to the third way of describing what happens in the new birth. What happens in the new birth is not the improvement of your old human nature, but it's the creation of a new human nature. Okay, so what does Jesus mean when he says, it must be born of water and of the Spirit? We'll look at the three main points, the three main views and these, are, these three are prevalent teachings throughout all the Christian churches. One thought is to be born of water refers to uh, physical birth. That's number one. Two births, one natural, one spiritual. Uh, that view says it's just like babies are born in a rush of water entering the world as a new creature. Natural birth parallels being born in the spirit as the new birth occurs within our hearts. I believe in 2 Corinthians. Yeah, in 2 Corinthians it says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. A person once born has physical life. A person twice born has eternal life. According to this view, Jesus was using a teaching technique he often used by comparing a spiritual truth with a physical reality. Now Nicodemus didn't understand spiritual birth. But he could understand physical birth. He knew what he was talking about. So that's where Jesus took him. Took him to the physical side of it. Number two. One birth. Spiritual birth with water referring to water baptism. I don't want to get into a doctrinal issue here, but um, as far as I can study, as far as I can see, as far as I understand it, uh, before this happens and after it happens, let's go back to that. Before and after these verses happen, there is no contextual support for water baptism for salvation and after these verses baptism is never mentioned before or after I'm just going to leave it there um, because there's no mention before or after the text of baptism so I don't think that the context of the scriptures supports this view we'll go to number three symbolic cleansing for spiritual renewal according to this view Born of water and born of the Spirit are different ways of saying the same thing. Or what it means to be born again. Jesus expected Nicodemus to understand what he was saying. Born of water refers to spiritual cleansing and Nicodemus would have naturally understood it that way. Um, we're going to go to verse 10. If we see in verse 10, Jesus said, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? That makes sense. Think about this. Verse 10 makes sense if Jesus was thinking about what Nicodemus knew from the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. Everything the Jews were, were functioning on was under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament writings. So when Jesus said to Nicodemus, um, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand what I'm talking about, he must have been referring to something that Nicodemus would have known. 
So he's, it seems that verse 10 is taking us back to the Old Testament. Okay, so throughout the Old Testament, water is used figuratively of spiritual cleansing. So the statement in verse 10 sends us back to the Old Testament where water and spirit are mentioned. And I'm going to take you to the book of Ezekiel. I'm going to take you to Ezekiel chapter 36. <clears throat> I didn't put the scripture on the slide, so if you want to just listen where you can find it. Ezekiel chapter 36 says this. Ezekiel the prophet speaking, God speaking through, the, to, through Ezekiel the prophet to his people. He says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. This is Ezekiel 36, 24 through 38. And I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clear water on, clean water on you. There's water. I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. There's a spirit. And the new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, would surely have been familiar with the concept of physical water representing spiritual purification. I think, I think that this passage... Um, that this is a passage that gives support to Jesus' words. Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Remember, we need to be new. We need to be transformed. We need life. We need a new way of seeing and thinking and valuing. Remember, Ephesians says that we are dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins. That means we have a heart of stone. We're dead. That's why Ezekiel speaks of a new heart and a new spirit. A heart of stone means the dead heart that was unfeeling, unresponsive to spiritual reality. The heart you had before you were born, before you knew birth, can feel. We know that we're driven by passions and desires in our unsaved state. So the heart does feel. Heart of stone means that it's a dead heart. It can respond with passions and desires to lots of different things before the new birth. But it's a stone when it comes to spiritual truth when it comes to the beauty of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the glory of God and the path of holiness, that is what has to change if we are to see the kingdom of God. God has to give us a new heart. In the new birth, God takes out the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh means that our heart becomes soft, becomes living, it becomes responsive, it becomes pliable, it becomes feeling, instead of being a lifeless stone. In the new birth, our dead, stony boredom with Christ is replaced by a heart that feels or spiritually senses the worth of Jesus Christ. In the new birth, God takes out a heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. That's conversion. That's transformation. That's being born new. The picture I have in my mind is that um, 
this new, warm, touchable, responsive, living heart is like a soft lump of clay. And the Holy Spirit, when God, when you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives inside you, it's like you have a heart of clay and the Holy Spirit presses himself into it and gives spiritual moral shape to it according to his own shape. By being himself within us, our heart and mind take on his character and his spirit. That's why I asked the question in the beginning, when you came in contact with Jesus Christ, did anything happen? Did anything change? Because a new birth is done in us and in the process of conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ takes place. One step at a time. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, our heart and our mind take on His character. The new, in the New Testament, it also uses water as a figure of the new birth. We talk about regeneration. Uh, regeneration is a washing. It's, it's something that takes place uh, by the washing of the Word, the Scripture says. <coughs> regeneration is called a washing, brought about by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, at the moment of salvation. That's in Titus 3, 5, Ephesians 5, John 13, 10. Christians are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians talks about uh, being justified, being washed, being sanctified. The washing that Paul speaks of here is a spiritual washing. So to sum up what happens in the new birth, we make it quick, Jake, I'm going to close with this. So we just wanted to close with this last point of being born again. Um, in the new birth, the Holy Spirit supernaturally gives us new spiritual life by connecting us with Jesus Christ through faith. Or to say it another way, the Spirit unites us to Christ where there is cleansing for our sins. And he replaces our hard, unresponsive heart with a soft heart that treasures Jesus above all things. And we are being transformed by the presence of the Spirit into the kind of heart that loves to do the will of God. That's what being born again is all about. We're dead in sin. We have a heart of stone. We're not alive to spiritual things. We don't, we don't really care about spiritual things. It doesn't matter to us. We know that even if we've heard all our lives that Jesus is Christ and He died on the cross for our sins, we can still float through our lives just knowing that, having the knowledge of that, but like Nicodemus did. And even realizing that, well, maybe Jesus is who He says He is because look at all the miracles He did back then. But Jesus told Nicodemus in, Nicodemus in both cases that wasn't good enough. That you needed to be born again. You needed to be uh, transformed. You needed to have a new heart. You needed to be spiritually cleansed and washed. So we need to know that being transformed by the presence of the Spirit into the kind of heart that loves to do the will of God. That's why I ask, has anything happened since you've met Christ? Can you look back to where you started and say, yeah, things have happened not adding things to our life, not trying to be better. It's not about being better or being good. It's about being going from being dead to being alive. It's not about not doing things to doing things. That has nothing to do with spiritual life. We talked about that in the beginning. We said that we can do a lot of different works, but that doesn't mean that we're spiritually alive, that we're just stuck in our works. So, to be responsive to the Holy Spirit in our lives, shows that we're alive spiritually and that we respond to his promptings in our life. That shows us, that can give us a gauge to go by whether we're born again or not. Okay, so let's stand for prayer. We'll close. I don't know if somebody wants to take off to get the kids. Bring them back in.
and then we'll go into worship. Father, we thank you, God, again for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can even just go through your word verse by verse, God, and that we can look at the different truths that your word has. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us. We thank you, God, that we even had the opportunity, that you've even been merciful enough to give us the opportunity to turn to you, that you've called us from death unto life, and that we can turn to you, and that we can be made alive in Christ. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We pray, Father, as we go, um, that you would be glorified in our lives and that the fruit would be prevalent on our branches. As we know, Father, we can say we're an apple tree all we want, but if our branches show that we have oranges on them, then we're deceiving ourselves. So we pray, Father, you do a work in us. We ask in Jesus' name.
oceans rise, but soon we'll rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. God, we thank you again for today, and we pray, Father, as we go, that um, that we could be a testimony and a witness to the new life that you've given us. We pray, God, for grace. As we go through our days, we know that some days are hard. We pray, Father, that you would help us to stay focused on the light of your word. We ask in Jesus' name.